Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to everybody to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Marisa Lagos. I am a politics correspondent at KQED and a co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast, which Congressman Liu will be on this evening. Um, I'm very excited to be here today with Congressman Liu. He is one of California's most visible representatives in Washington. Since 2015, he has served LA's 33rd district, where he's gained a national platform for his policies, and as one of the most uh, followed government officials on Twitter, over a million followers, 1.1 I think now. He uses that platform to both advocate for the Democratic Party and very often take on President Donald Trump and his policies. We're going to talk about Twitter, Trump, democracy, more T words if I can think of them for the next hour. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Ted Lee to the Commonwealth Club. So I don't want to offend you, but I don't think you were as well known before Donald Trump took office. Is that fair? That is correct. <laughs> yes. I you, give him credit for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, th there's been all kinds of people that have risen up to <laughs> after Trump. So you really, um, I think, use the platform in a way that has gotten attention not just because of what you say, but kind of how you say it. And, and I'm curious kind of what inspired what, maybe one of those first tweets. Because, again, you were kind of the mild-mannered yeah. L.A. congressman before Trump took office. So, so thank you for that question. Uh, let me f first say, uh, having dealt with the Trump administration for over uh, two years, it's always a thrill when I can sit in front of normal, rational, kind people. So... <laughs> And thank you for uh, interviewing me, Marisa. I, ho I hope he's including me in that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. <laughs> uh, so to answer your question, uh, it's uh, all based on anger, uh, but I count to 10 before I write something. I would wish the president would do that. Uh, but my view is uh, we cannot normalize what should not be normalized. And if Trump is going to do 57 crazy things a month, I think we have to call out all 57 crazy things. You um, told a reporter once Michelle Obama had that beautiful line, when they go low, we go high. I thought about it a lot, but I also thought we lost the election. My view now is that when they go low, we fight back. Yep. <laughs> Do you ever worry about kind of the, the negative potential implications of that, like being dragged down with this president and, and some of the rhetoric that we see, especially on social media? So I think you'd fight back without uh, being dragged down. Uh, one of the reasons I use humor sometimes when I uh, do my fighting back, uh, one of my views is that uh, satire and humor can reveal truth in a way that some other forms of communication cannot do as well. Uh, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal was one of my favorite literary works. And so I think there are ways to do it uh, where you do fight back uh, without uh, engaging them at, at the very lowest levels. Is your family surprised? Oh, yeah. yeah. My, uh, so my mom called me last year and there went something like this. Um, are you sure it's okay you say these things about the president? Yeah, so. But she what was coming from the view of she, uh, she was concerned about my safety. Right. And she came from a different place, a different time, different country. And uh, I said, I believe in American democracy. And in America, we get to say whatever we want to say. Right, that's true. I, I also, though, wonder, I mean, she might be worried about your safety when it comes to the government. Um, I, you know, having been tagged in some posts with you over the last few years because of this event, I mean, the vitriol uh, and, and the, the attacks you see on Twitter are really um, striking, not just for the number, but the nastiness. I mean, have you ever been concerned about your safety? Uh, every now and then, it'll cross my mind. And Sometimes people will go above and beyond just a Twitter post, and right. sometimes if they say something very specific that's uh, very threatening that identifies like a specific way they're going to take me out, then Capitol Police will get involved and will, you know, have folks uh, that they're more aware of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, I'll just thank these people for reading my tweet. Yeah. It's funny you say that because sometimes that actually disarms people, right? Because they think of you as, and, and this happens to me as a reporter, like it's like you're not a person, you're, you're the congressman, and sometimes just responding actually helps. Right, right. Or if they, you know, sometimes folks will say, you know, how you know, stupid and idiotic my tweet is, and I, I'll respond, thank you for reading it, and it makes them think about why they're reading my tweets if they think it's always stupid and idiotic. <laughs> <So dumb. laughs> yeah. Well, what, has it changed your life? I mean, 
having more than a million Twitter followers being, you know, on TV a lot more because of both that and your position in the judiciary, which we'll get to. I mean, do people recognize you more now than they did a few years ago? Yes. So in the past, if I was in a suit like this, people would recognize me. Uh, now I'll be in a t-shirt and glasses at the grocery store and people recognize me. It's very unnerving. And I keep thinking maybe I shouldn't be in a t-shirt or you know, <laughs> like, I, should have called I think my you're hair. allowed to wear a t-shirt yeah, even so. as a congressman, right? Yeah. Uh, is that just in your district or kind of? No, everywhere? it's sort of all, all over the place. Yeah. yeah. So what does your immediate family think? I mean, you have teenage boys. I'm sure they're on social media. Are they uh, impressed by their dad's celebrity status or? Do they care? No, they're doing their own thing. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've a, I have a 16-year-old and a, and a 13-year-old, and they totally uh, don't like politics, which is good. Yeah. They, one wants to be an engineer. The other one wants to be a Fortnite gamer and win lots of money that way. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation <laughs> that we can have when YouTuber becomes a thing to do. Um, all right. Well, you, I, I want to back up and talk about a little bit about your life story. You were born in Taiwan. Your parents yep. moved the family to the United States when you were three, um, and they ended up in Cleveland. Right. Uh, I mean, do you consider that home still? Is there anything, I don't know, that you miss about the Midwest or liked about growing up there? Yeah, so with, with apologies to 49er fans, I am still a long-suffering Cleveland Browns fan. Ah, the truth um, comes out. I, I try not to do that. It's hard to follow the Browns. I, I'm very pleased that our 20-year rebuilding plan is showing signs of progress. Uh, and I still have some friends uh, in Cleveland. So I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the Midwest. Yeah. Talk about a little bit what it was like growing up with your family. I know your parents started their own businesses. Um, they came here really with very little, right? Yes. Yeah, so my dad first came and he started out as a dishwasher uh, at various restaurants. And then a little bit later, uh, my mom and I came and we started off living in the basement of a person's home. And my parents would go to flea markets and sell gifts to make ends meet. And then eventually over uh, many years, they were able to open one, shopping, uh, one store in a shopping center and then later on one store in the shopping mall. And then my brother and I would help watch that store because uh, we were free labor. Um, eventually they opened over six stores. Wow. In my mind, they achieved the American dream. They went from being poor to a home, gave my brother and I an amazing education, and it's uh, one reason I joined the U.S. Air Force on active duty. I believe uh, this country has given my family so much, I wanted to give back. Uh, by the way, my brother is a doctor now, and my parents still remind me of that. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> one million Twitter followers, who cares about that? He's a doctor. Um, yeah. Do you, I mean... I mean, I know you and I have discussed this before, but I imagine your parents did not really have a lot of time for politics. Um, and and no, being no. immigrants, um, I think, as you sort of alluded to, there's often a different approach to how do you deal with government when you come from a place that maybe is more oppressive or a different system. I, I mean, what do you think your sort of teenage self would have thought if you had told him that this is where you'd be? I, they would not have imagined it. And so they, we were just trying to make it, right? We were just trying to survive, and, and politics was the furthest thing away f uh, from our minds, um, which makes this interesting thought uh, that I just came, I was thinking about. So, uh, so my parents came here legally, uh, but they still wanted very little to do with the government. Uh, mm -hmm. They were, I mean, they didn't speak English that well, they, and they were scared, right? Because um, a lot of times what government is is it's sort of law enforcement, it's people who could sort of do bad things. So I'm just going to translate it here. The notion that an undocumented immigrant would go and vote is ridiculous, right? Because they're trying not to be seen. They're trying right. not to be engaged and to risk a felony prosecution to go be one vote among thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions is ridiculous. So the whole notion that the president has that somehow all these illegal votes are happening is absurd. It just is not how people actually act in reality. Yeah. I wonder if that sort of you know, distrust of government. Um, did you push back on that? Because as you mentioned, you ended up, you know, joining the military, but I, I wonder as a, a high school student, I mean, w were those conversations that you were challenging your parents on at all? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, I, I, they, so they were, they were doing their business and um, it was, uh, the conversation was, we, ne we actually never really talked about politics. Do yeah. they now, um, I don't know. Do they do they talk engage you now around policy yeah, so, so debates? So one amazing thing that the Trump administration has caused. Uh, so having gone to law school and 
anyone here who's a lawyer, you'll know I'm telling the truth when I say we never learned about the emoluments clause. Never heard of it. I never heard of the emoluments. Now my parents know what that is, right? Half America knows what the emoluments yeah. clause is. And so you have this huge amount of civic education happening, uh, including my parents. Who that was a silver lining. Yeah, I've never heard that, Congressman. <laughs> much more engaged yeah. uh, in, in government and politics in a way uh, never before. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of dancing around this, but as I was reading your bio and looking at your history, it almost seems like you, you sh I don't know, should be or could be a more conservative politician, right? You came from, you know, this immigrant Taiwanese background. You joined the Air Force. You were a prosecutor. How do you feel like you ended up where you are? Uh, so, well, so it is all based on anger right now. Um, <laughs> but you were a fairly but, progressive politician prior to right. Trump. Uh, but, there, but I'm also a big believer in the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And when I see... Uh, the President of the United States continually violate the rule of law uh, and take actions uh, that uh, attack the rule of law. Uh, it, it doesn't just sort of bother me. It, it's my view that it is dangerous to democracy. And so it's one reason I do what I do. Yeah. So before, before you did this, you, you went to Stanford. You majored in computer science. Did you think you would end up going into like, more of a technical career? So I'm a recovering computer science major. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, it was very hard, and I thought there are a lot more people smarter than me uh, uh, at doing this. Although I he do still wish, has a Stanford degree in so, <laughs> computer science. Okay. Although I sometimes do wish I stuck with it, because then I, I don't know, be in Silicon Valley right now, and probably like on a yacht somewhere, right? But you may so, not have yeah. a million Twitter followers. So there's that. <laughs> um, and then you ended up going to law school. What you know? What made you decide to turn that way in your career? So. Um, I wanted to cause change, hopefully for the better, and my view was law was one way to do that, uh, either through lawsuits or, or through government. And I remember this uh, experience I had when I w worked at Legal Aid Society of Cleveland for a summer. It was, it was an amazing experience. I remember helping these clients come in and try to get them uh, either benefits that were denied or, or, or help them with discrimination suits and so on. And after a while I realized, well, I could do this one at a time, or we could change some policies and then help a lot of people all, all at once. And so law is one way you can do that. So did you imagine that you might go into more of a public service career when you entered law school? So I wanted to be in a place where I could affect change where, wherever that might be. Uh, I actually knew I was going to go into the Air Force okay. JAG, and I may have stayed in the Air Force for a career. Um, but... I met my beautiful wife, and uh, she just was not going to move every three years. And so, Fair. so then I went. So now you commute to DC. <laughs> yeah, right. So what what drew you to the Air Force, and to, well, maybe we'll start with that, but then and then to, to JAG. But um. I, I, all the military branches are, are amazing and awesome. Uh, the Air Force actually had just had more opportunities uh, okay. for folks like me. Uh, their view. So first of all, I don't have twenty twenty vision. Uh, and I think their view was, if you, if you can't fly, we actually don't care how blind you are, and so we'll use you in all these uh, different positions. Um, and so that's one reason I entered the Air Force. Uh, some, I, uh, for example, did apply uh, to the Marines, but I was rejected because of my eyesight. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Even if you wanted to be a prosecutor there? Or Correct. Did they have that? Yeah. Yep. So talk about your experience in the Air Force. I mean, what, what were you doing? What was sort of, what did you learn there? So I'll talk about a particular operation. It was known as Operation Pacific Haven. And I was stationed at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam at the time. And uh, Saddam Hussein was going to row into northern Iraq and kill thousands of Kurds. So the United States um, went in there, extracted thousands and thousands of Kurds from northern Iraq, and flew them uh, to Guam based in there. Uh, I was chief of operations law, and we had to such you make sure that you didn't have any Saddam loyalists or spies or other folks that shouldn't be there. And then we sent most of them to the United States. And the ones that were bad people, uh, we also sent to the United States, but then they ended up you know, at Edwards Air Force Base at a detention facility or some other place. But it was an amazing experience, and I remember watching uh, these Kurds come off these planes carrying everything they had with them, wearing mm. six layers of clothes. It was 90 degrees in Guam at the time. And I thought, you know, not many countries would have done this. Uh, we basically risked treasure and personnel to do this because they had helped us against Saddam Hussein. 
If we hadn't done this, it would have been maybe a one-day international story. Not even sure Americans would have known about it. Um, but we did this because we believe we owe them uh, for what they did to help America. And then later on, I had this amazing experience to go to Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I was a legislator at the time. And we met with President Barzani. It was about a 45-minute meeting. And then as I was walking away, a young staffer comes up to me. And he said, I was uh, a child departing one of those planes in Guam. And you saved my life and that of my family's. Wow. He eventually went to the East Coast to get educated, and he went back to Iraqi Kurdistan to, to help his country. So wow. it was, uh, and powerful. to this day, the Kurds are still one of America's strongest allies. Yeah. Because we, we went in and, and, and uh, defended them. Was that under what Clinton that was at under the time. Clinton. Interesting. Right. I mean, when you think about that and that time in your life, did you... Did you consider yourself a Democrat then? Were you already, um, like, do you feel like that changed oh. <laughs> your political sort of leanings? Um, I like Bill Clinton. Uh, I didn't think a lot about politics at the time, but I uh, liked President Clinton. And so if you asked me at that, at that time, I would have said I was a Democrat. So you're still in the reserves. You're a Correct. lieutenant colonel now. Is that the, uh, or colonel? How do we... uh, so, uh, despite every bad thing I did, I was promoted to colonel. <laughs> <laughs> does that, I, talk about being in the reserve. So what does that entail? And yeah, is it, is it in any way weird now being a politician and going back and, and doing your... Well, so one thing is that I'm very careful when I'm on reserve duty. Uh, I, I do no social media. I, um, I do nothing except the reserve duty. And um, I follow orders, whoever they come from, whether it's the president or, or a general or, or someone lower. And... Um, that's what I do. Yeah. But when I'm not on reserve duty, then I'm in Congress it. and I tweet. And how yeah. often? <laughs> how often does the reserve duty call? So it comes out to approximately four weeks uh, a month, and you sort of work a year. work it out with. The, I'm sorry, a year. <laughs> yes. I was like, wow. I'm sorry, four weeks That's a year, and you schedule it with with Air Force. Interesting. Uh, but the needs of Air Force come first. Okay. All right. So you're in the Air Force for a while. How long? I mean, how long were you on active duty? So, uh, a little over four years active, and then with reserves, it's about 22 years now. Wow. Yeah. So when you got out, you um, did some litigation work, I understand? What Correct. So I'm also a recovering lawyer as well. And I um, went into private practice uh, at the law firm Munger, Toes, and Olson. So I did that for about two and a half years. And then I went uh, in-house counsel for a financial services firm saw every way to lose money in the stock market. Um, and then I was elected to Torrance City Council for a term. How did you, what, what, what made you decide to run for city council? Ah, so I had help uh, then Assemblyman George Nakano uh, with uh, his assembly races, uh, gotten to be friends with him. And I was pretty happy just doing what I was doing. And then one day he calls me and he says, hey, three seats are opening up on the city council. I wasn't aware of that. And he said, I think you should run. And, um, and then I did. Okay. That's what happened. It was that phone call. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, which is not unusual, right? Like, we hear that story a lot. You, you, you get asked. Um, was that, did that surprise Betty, your wife? She, yeah, she was pregnant at the time. So it probably <laughs> wasn't the, the, uh, the most optimal time to yeah. do this. Um, but you can't change, right, election dates and so on. But, uh, but she, was, she was happy that we won. Yeah. So you were on that co the council for a couple of years before you went to the state legislature. Um, is there anything, I, I don't know, you worked on there that you feel like right. you're particularly proud of or has informed kind of what you've done since then? Uh, so um, I started a push to have green buildings for the city of Torrance. Uh, and if you sort of look at energy use, nearly half of energy use is from buildings, right, like this one. And if you, let's say you want to have everyone drive hydrogen cars, right? Hard. You got to make the car. You got to make it at a reasonable price so people buy it. Then you have to have hydrogen fueling stations all over the place. If you just green this building, no one here would really know. If there's solar panels on this roof, you wouldn't know. If you had, you know, you know better greener wood and, and other sorts of uh, more sustainable uh, forms of building construction materials, you wouldn't know. It doesn't really affect you. And so there's a way to green all these buildings that doesn't cause massive behavior change. And I think it's sort of low hanging fruit and we should do a lot more of that. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about the presidential race, but you know, yesterday there was this um, yeah. 
what, like 20 hours, CNN town hall or whatever, right. um, with <laughs> a bunch of the, it was seven hours, but um, with the candidates and, and one thing I think, you know, they got questions about things like plastic straws and then Trump's tweeting out photos of the straws he's selling. Um, right. For real. And um, I'm just curious, like, is that something you think Democrats need to talk about differently? Because it is a hard sell to say you all need to change your behavior. Um, and I think that the Republicans are trying to set up things like the Green New Deal and, and maybe some of the stuff you're talking about, um, you know, in a way that they think that they can make political hay about it. So one reason I ran for Congress uh, is uh, my view that there are certain issues where you have to do beyond what a state can do. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, I was a co-author of AB 32, California's Landmark Global Warming Solutions Act. It was also clear to me that we could just go dark tomorrow in California, use no energy, and it wouldn't really matter. Uh, what you actually need is America to do what California has done, and mm -hmm. then the rest of the world to do what California has done, and then we would have a chance at mitigating climate change. So every term I've introduced uh, a bill uh, sort of trying to take California's law and make it national, uh, essentially. And in terms of public sentiment, it continues to keep going towards those right. uh, who understand climate change is real. It's mostly caused by humans, and it's a huge threat to our humanity. And you see, especially among young people, both conservatives and liberals, uh, be way on the side of trying to uh, do something about climate change. So I think the Republicans are, are, have a losing battle now uh, in terms of climate change and trying to push policies uh, that really fly in the face of what reality is. When you talk to your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I mean, do you think that there are people that would support some of these things, but the leadership just won't let the vote come up? Or, like, what's the biggest challenge? Uh, so you already see a shift in how people talk about it. So even a decade ago, you would have a number of Republicans say it's a hoax. Right. Uh, we recently had a hearing, I'm in the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we had a hearing on how climate change affects our national security. And the Republican ranking member's opening statement, he basically acknowledged climate change, and acknowledged it was a threat to our national security, and that it was caused by humans. It was pretty remarkable, his statement. Yeah. It's something you wouldn't have heard a, a decade ago. So you see a shift happening. Um, now, I think what some of them would say is, what would be the best solution given this problem? So I am, first of all, I will support anything that will take carbon and methane out of the air. Uh, so I am, am a co-author and author of a number of different pieces of legislation. One of them uh, is basically a carbon fee and dividend bill. What it would mm -hmm. do is essentially um, adequately price carbon for the damage it's causing uh, to humanity. And the revenues raised from that will then give back to American people. Do you think that... I, so I, that could get Republican support. Yeah. I mean, I'm always sort of interested, too. You mentioned the national security threat, and we've been hearing that pretty... I mean, in no uncertain terms, I think, from the, the folks on the military side of things right. who have been allowed to say those things under this administration. I, do you see that as an opening, too? Because it's always surprised me that that has not been more of a clarion call for at least some conservatives in D.C., well, so what's interesting is in the last few years, you have groups normally not identified as progressive coming out in support of acknowledging climate change is real, being caused by humans, and we need to do something about it. They include the U.S. military, uh, they include the Catholic Church, and they include ExxonMobil, right? So if you look at oil companies, they will say it is real. And they I mean, they're also, still not thrilled about They're not thrilled about it. Um, but at least what, for example, ExxonMobil will say is they do support a uh, carbon fee. Right. Which is pretty remarkable. Which is like level. a starting point. I think, yeah, so what I tell Republicans is, well, what does ExxonMobil know that you don't? Yeah. So, yeah. But, <laughs> probably a few yeah. things, actually. <laughs> all of us don't. Um, all right, before we get into Trump and impeachment, because I know you guys all want to talk about that, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about your time in Sacramento. Um, yeah. Starting with, it strikes me that you were there um, during both Schwarzenegger and, and Jerry Brown. Um, and, and speaking of climate change, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger has sort of become, I think, reinvented himself yet another time in recent years. And has been a really big critic of the Republican Party. And I'm just curious, as somebody who was stuck there as I was until the wee hours of the morning yeah. trying to debate or, you know, trying to figure out what they were going to do around budget bills. Are you surprised to see kind of like his his arc here? 
so Governor Schwarzenegger uh, did sign AB 32, yeah. so I give him credit for that. Um, there was only one Republican legislator that voted for it. Everybody else voted against it. And I didn't really understand where they were coming from for quite a long time until I saw this documentary, Merchants of Doubt. It's also a book, so if any of you uh, can, you should go either read the book or watch the documentary. And it sort of goes through pretty convincingly why otherwise normal Republicans who believe in their doctor, who believe in physics and chemistry, when it comes to climate change, they do this bizarre sort of anti-science mm -hmm. approach. And it sort of comes a lot based on ideology that if this were true, what it would mean is, in their minds, massive big government. That all of a sudden the government now controls and has all this uh, regulation on energy and energy production. Which is why if you ran something like a carbon fee and dividend bill that said, okay, we're just going to price carbon at what it should be priced, take those revenues, and then we're going to give it back to American people. We don't grow government. Um, we don't. Sounds a little like Andrew Yang's dividend. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, he just the, wants to give money. Yeah. To, to the American people. But he's modeling yeah. off of the Alaska model, which is right. that Alaskans get money back from the oil companies, correct. right? Which is correct. Semi-similar. Yeah. But Andrew Yang is correct that at some point in the future, we're going to have even more Americans with skills that society does not need. And what do you do with that? So at some point, you're either going to have to move to a universal basic income model, or you're going to have to find ways to retrain them into skills society needs. And that's going to be harder and harder as automation and artificial intelligence replaces human tasks. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we'll move forward in time. You, we should note, you did run against Kamala Harris in 2010 for attorney general. Can't tell you what I learned from that? What did you learn? Never run against Kamala Harris. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, I'm interested because you're, you know, you're a big supporter of hers. You endorsed her early on. She has stalled a little in the polls. Are you still pretty bullish about her chances of winning the nomination? I am. It's a long race. Uh, it's still early. And uh, she will still be in the top tier of candidates yeah. uh, when Iowa starts. And then we see what people do in, in all these different states. Is it like awkward in uh, the Capitol at all these days? You've got Booker, Klobuchar, Harris, like they all seem to get along, but that's in front of us. Are, is there any like weirdness? <laughs> no, they, people do are respectful and they do, yeah. they do get along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Swalwell dropped out, so, so <laughs> one less, I suppose. Um, so you also ran against Marion Williamson when you uh, won your congressional seat. Correct. That was a very crowded, very interesting field of candidates. Yep. I mean, what do you think now watching her on the national stage? I like being at deep, I wouldn't call them debates because we had like 16 people running, but places where we would all talk. And um, I enjoyed when she was there because she uh, gave very interesting speeches and talks. And um, I think she's a, a very good and um, wonderful person. Yeah, she's interesting. I mean, she definitely, I think, got a lot of attention around her answers to say reparations questions, and um, you know, they all they all bring something different to the field. But right. I, I, it seems like she has become a lot more savvy since that race. I mean, she's running as a Democrat for one. She made it onto the debate stage. Yep. Um, do you feel like she is, <laughs> despite her quirkiness, a more polished candidate than she was when you guys ran against one another? Um. Yes, she. I think she, she is. She was. She's more attuned to uh, democratic politics in a way that she was not as attuned to at the time. That's correct. All right. So let's let's talk about Trump. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, you pretty quickly into his term became, I think, one of the more outspoken. Um, Critics on Twitter. You also, as you mentioned, sit on Arm Armed Services. You sit on the Judiciary Committee. Um, I mean, talk about where you guys are around impeachment and that sure. inquiry, yeah. and um, yeah, like how you are approaching it as a former prosecutor and you know as somebody who kind of has that law background. Uh, so on the House uh, Judiciary Committee, uh, we're right now in an impeachment inquiry. So we're uh, holding hearings, uh, getting documents, reviewing evidence to decide whether or not we should pass articles of impeachment against Donald Trump. Having read the Mueller report, by the way, it's okay if you haven't read the Mueller report. It is very long, um, but if you haven't done so, you should at least read uh, the executive summaries. Uh, there's one for volume one, there's one for volume two. 
Um, it doesn't take that long to read. So if you haven't done that, you should do that. It's very clear uh, from uh, the special counsel investigation uh, that Donald Trump committed multiple felonies. Uh, basically, what uh, Rob Mueller does in volume two of the report is he says, okay, here are 10 instances of obstruction of justice. Here are three elements to establish the crime of obstruction of justice. And then for some of those instances, he literally will say, substantial evidence for you know, element one, substantial evidence for element two, substantial evidence for element three. You look at it, you don't have to be a former federal prosecutor, you look at it and you go, well, that's, that's a crime. And that's why over uh, 1,000 former federal prosecutors signed a letter saying that any other American faced with this evidence would have been indicted. Now, what members of Congress do with that fact, it's up to them, up to their conscience, up to their districts, but you cannot look at this and conclude that Donald Trump did not commit a crime. He committed multiple felonies. Understanding that this is a political as well as legal question, I mean, if tomorrow the House Judiciary voted on whether to hold impeachment hearings, where would you be? Yes. You would vote yes. Do you feel like the obstruction of justice approach is, is the best one? I mean, you brought up emoluments earlier. It f feels oh, to me like right. there's some other cases yeah. to be made. There's the campaign finance questions around the Stormy Daniels payments, right. which I know you guys are going to hold hearings on. Like, is part of the problem, politically at least, that obstruction is, I don't know, more vague in some ways than some of these other questions? So the reason uh, we focus on obstruction is because there's an entire volume dedicated right. to it by the special counsel investigation. <clears throat> uh, but you're right, there are a number of other felonies that the president committed. So Michael Cohen, right, Donald Trump's former lawyer, is sitting in prison partly for engaging in a criminal conspiracy to silence two women who had negative stories about affairs with Donald Trump. We also know that Trump wrote the checks that were integral to that criminal conspiracy. Again, any other American uh, will be sitting next to Michael Cohen right now in, the, in prison. And the only reason he's not is because there's a Department of Justice uh, OLC opinion that says uh, the President of the United States, who's a sitting president, cannot be indicted. Uh, so we're going to have a hearing on that as well, on uh, their criminal conspiracy to silence two women who had a series of affairs during a campaign. We're also going to be looking at emoluments clause uh, violations. Uh, there are a number of uh, other violations that we'll be exploring, including dangling pardons and intimidating witnesses. Does like his Twitter feed give you guys a roadmap to some of these investigations? <clears throat> um, Sometimes he'll tweet out something uh, that uh, does look like he's trying to intimidate a witness. And so um, we'll be exploring some of those issues as well. That is correct. You mentioned that OLC opinion. And, you know, I think that that is something that um, has really stymied Democrats and, and, and led to a lot of frustration on the left around the way that Mueller talked about his report. Right. I mean, would you support if a Democrat gets elected next year? I don't know, could they direct DOJ to repeal that? Like, what would be a path? And, and do you think that it should be repealed? I think it should be appealed because it's nowhere in the Constitution. If you look at the U.S. Constitution, you will nowhere <laughs> find any sentence that says the president cannot be indicted. We also know in our past U.S. history, a sitting vice president has been indicted. Uh, so, again, I, I don't know... Um, what the constitutional basis is uh, mm -hmm. for this opinion, but but it is what it is. There is that uh, opinion, and that, and that does that only uh, relate to federal crimes. Like, do, is it your belief that the AG of say New York could prosecute Trump for yes. something? You do yes, believe that? I do believe that. Correct. So, do you think? I mean, what would be the pathway to my earlier question about of of actually repealing that memo? Is that something that the DOJ would have to decide? Could a president yeah, direct the, them? The, the next uh, attorney general could simply say. Uh, I'm reversing this policy. Okay. It's just a policy. Right. Yeah. It's been sort of uh, talked about like it's a law, I feel it's like. It's not a law. Yeah, it's <laughs> just a policy. All right. Um, so immigration is another huge issue that I think it, it's clear that the president is going to run on. One of our audience members is asking if you have practical solutions for solving our immigration challenges right. um, to actually move the dialogue to a more productive place. That's, that, that's a great question. I support comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, so the U.S. Senate, on a bipartisan basis a few years ago, passed a um, comprehensive immigration bill that largely did about three major things. One is uh, it did uh, continue to increase border security. Uh, we're a sovereign nation. 
we get to control our borders. I, I support that. It also allowed con um, these visas to continue, such as H-1B visas, for companies to get the workers they need for the 21st century if they can't get it uh, through the existing workforce. And then it provided a pathway to citizenship uh, for uh, the millions of people here who are undocumented. It never got a vote uh, in the House of Representatives. It was controlled by Republicans at the time. Uh, so I think we should now look, uh, since we do control the House, uh, look at doing comprehensive immigration reform as well. Uh, I can tell you things, some things that won't work. Um, we know that the change in terms of people trying to enter the United States has changed, uh, where you basically have families and women and children showing up and applying for asylum. Uh, they will, they're not like trying to run across the border, they're basically going to a port of entry or they're going to a place where there's no port of entry and like waving and trying to get border patrol right. to pick them up. So a wall would not actually solve that uh, in any way. And it really is just a massive waste of money. And it's not even me saying it. If you look at their members of Congress at the, at the border, who, including Republicans, right. they all oppose the wall. And they'll say it's one of the most inefficient ways to try to deal with this problem. I wonder if you think, having served in the armed forces, if there's going to be any fallout from the president's decision this week to basically yeah. move over $3 billion away from military yeah. projects. And we're talking about, I mean, some of them are like, you know, a garage and a child care center at West Point and um, projects at military bases around the world. I mean, I guess being in the reserves, I know you said you don't talk politics there, but do you get any sense of whether there could be sort of political repercussions from people who might otherwise be right. Republicans? Uh, absolutely. So we already have seen some Republicans come out uh, and oppose this because it's affecting their districts. Right. Uh, w I also know uh, that um, the way the appropriations process works, uh, to me, this is likely illegal. Okay. I mean, Congress doesn't just sort of go to DOD and say, hey, here's $3 check. billion dollars and spend however you want. It's very specific. It's right. like, we're going to have this amount of money for this daycare center and this amount of money for, you know, this depot at this base. And Congress writes these specific appropriations. We have the power of their purse. So we'll see what the courts do with that. I also want to sort of take a step back and help people understand the scale of this money. Uh, it's actually not a lot compared to what he wants to do. So as we sit here right now, uh, Donald Trump has not built a single inch of new wall outside where there's been already an existing physical barrier, right? So that's the reality. <clears throat> so he wants to now try to do that, which he hasn't been able to do for two and a half years. To do that, to complete his wall in areas where there already isn't an existing physical barrier, estimates are about $60 billion. So what we're talking about here is sort of a one-time shot of, you know, three and a half billion because it's not going to happen again, right? Congress has now learned, oh, the president has said he's going to, you know, do this. So we're going to be very, very, very specific in how we write future appropriation bills to say you cannot do this. Uh, so such he's going to be able to build, I don't know, another, you know, maybe 5% of what he wants to do. And then that's it. And so uh, to me, this is uh, actually conceding defeat. He can't really get the money any other way. Now he's going to get this, you know, drop in the bucket amount mm -hmm. for what he really wants to do. Uh, and uh, it is going to hurt, uh, unfortunately, uh, some military bases. But I mean, I don't personally think he's doing that to build the wall, right? He's doing it for political reasons. Like he made a campaign promise. He wants to be able to go and stand in front of something next year. Um, does that matter? Yeah, it would make sense if what he campaigned on is I'm going to use uh, U.S. military funds to build a wall. Uh, <laughs> that's not what he said, right? He really said Mexico's going to build it. And mm -hmm. think about why he felt compelled to say that because he knows it's stupid to use U.S. taxpayer dollars <laughs> to build a wall, because otherwise he just would have said, want to use U.S. taxpayer dollars to build a wall. Right. So. Um, and not to mention all that. People really like down in like Texas when you take away their land. I'm sure that eminent, those them eminent them well. domain fights right. are going to go pretty well. Um, well, this kind of brings up an interesting question, which is, which is the power of Congress and, and um, how it has changed under this president, we heard Mitch McConnell say this week, for example, you know, I'll put a gun bill on the floor if the president says he'll support it. Um, we've had, you know, these fights happen with appropriations where there's, an, even if Congress, you know, congressional Republicans voted for the appropriations bill, they're not out there screaming in the same way that maybe Democrats are. Um, 
and and one of the audience members asks about just the issue of what if Democrats win the White House but still do not hold the Senate? Is there a way to work with Republicans there? Um, I, I mean, to me, right. it seems like McConnell is the biggest challenge there. Correct. Uh, so the House of Representatives on a bipartisan basis has passed a number of pieces of legislation that will help Americans. One is a universal background checks bill on guns. It had a bipartisan support. Uh, we also passed uh, legislation on uh, the Violence Against Women's Act. Uh, we passed legislation on the Equality Act. Uh, we passed a number of bills that are sitting in the U.S. Senate and Mitch McConnell uh, is not taking them up for a vote. And so we're trying to put pressure on uh, the U.S. Senate to take those bills up for a vote because if he took them up for a, bill, uh, for a vote, they would pass. If the Democrats won the White House, uh, regardless of what the U.S. Senate does, uh, a Democratic president can reverse all the stupid executive orders that Trump has put in. Uh, so just that alone would be um, important. Uh, and obviously, a Democratic president would select different Supreme Court justices uh, as well. Do you think, well, whether they would get confirmed, I guess, is <laughs> an open question. Um, I mean, do you feel like Congress as an institution has been weakened because of some of the deference we've seen Republicans give Donald Trump? And, and, and the unusual ways, I mean, regardless of your position on his policies, that he's acted. So that's a great question. So there's two things going on. Um, in terms of laws and, and legal matters, uh, I think Congress has actually been somewhat strengthened mm -hmm. because we've filed a number of court cases um, where the ministry is saying we're not providing documents, we're providing witnesses and so on, and we're winning them. Uh, so in sort of ironic way, Bill Barr, the Justice Department, wanted this imperial presidency, but because of the sort of silly arguments in court and taking out these silly cases, courts are ruling against the administration and, and for Congress. And then these are law, right? I mean, this, these opinions and, right. and they set precedent. But in terms of sort of norms, uh, Congress has sort of been weakened because now you have a president breaking all sorts of norms. And um, because Republicans control one of the chambers of Congress, Congress has not been able to effectively push back very much uh, until you have both houses willing to push back on the president. Uh, he's going to be able to continue breaking these norms and doing silly things. And there's not much we can do. Well, um, I have a question from the audience asking if it's my fault. No. Is it the fault of the media that they have amplified Trump's tweets by repeating and discussing them, um, even when they're absurd, and he's using them to distract? And this person notes that a lot of people are not actually on Twitter. It's sort of those of us in, right. in the political chattering class. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Obviously, you've decided strategically to, to push back. So that's an interesting question. I, I would love it if people just ignored the president, but that's, that's not going to happen, right? Because right. he, he is the president. the president. And it's not um, even particularly to Trump. Any president has a megaphone, and um, the press is just going to cover the president of the United States. So uh, the notion that we're just going to ignore what Trump says um, would be interesting if we could actually execute and implement that. I don't think it's possible. So since we can't just ignore what the president says, I think we simply have to uh, then highlight it if it's false or if it's misleading or if it's harmful or if it's dangerous. Uh, so that's why I do what I do. Uh, I also do do it on Facebook. Um, I'm trying to do Instagram. I'm not really good with the pictures opposing the president as much. Um, so working on that. Yeah. We're all working on Instagram, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to talk about another big issue that I, that I alluded to earlier, which is, which is the NRA and guns. Um, we have seen, obviously, House Democrats earlier this year pass a pretty strong package of gun legislation. I know after the last, um, unfortunately, several shootings, there's been calls for an even stronger uh, response from the House. McConnell is obviously dragging his feet. I mean, strategically, what do you think Democrats should be doing? Is there an argument to bring another bill up just to, right. you know, get the attention yeah. of the nation. Uh, so, so my view is that um, public sentiment is everything. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had this great quote, and he said, public sentiment is everything. Uh, with it, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And a large uh, part of what we're trying to do is to shift public sentiment. And you've seen that over the years, uh, that shift towards more Americans realizing we need gun safety laws. 
And with uh, the NRA weakening, you have, I think, at least five board members that have resigned. Uh, you have financial mismanagement. Um, by the way, I should note that the NRA CEO, Wayne LaPierre, uh, did come to my district in Beverly Hills and drop like $18,000 on expensive suits using nonprofit money. So I thank him for spending that money in Beverly Hills. Um, I also do wonder how the NRA can still be a nonprofit if they're going to spend that money that way. Uh, that's just an aside. So the NRA... Um, I got to look, in, look into that. Yeah, yeah. KQED is a nonprofit. Yeah. Nah, nah. <laughs> so the NRA uh, has weakened. And um, last term, something happened that wasn't reported all that much. So for many, many years, the NRA opposed the government even doing research on uh, how gun violence can affect people's health. Uh, so we re reversed that in Congress. So now the Centers for Disease Control can, in fact, uh, do that research. Um, so you start to see these little breaks. Mm -hmm. And I do believe we will probably get some sort of red flag legislation passed this term, you do. which uh, essentially uh, would allow a family member to notify authorities and say, hey, I, I think Uncle Joe is, or, or Uncle, or, or Andy Mary or whatever is uh, unstable, probably shouldn't have a gun. And um, that's also something that the NRA opposes. So you keep taking these little steps and eventually you'll take a big step. And so you just keep pushing. Yeah. Why do you think they are becoming weaker? I mean, because, I mean, there's the public sentiment side, but there's also... The, what you talked about, which is the sort of turmoil in their ranks and these questions. Um, and I think w one thing that's always fascinating me about the NRA is how well they've done at sort of convincing the public or politicians that a majority of the public is with them, even when polling right. shows they aren't. Um, so, I mean, what is it? Is, is it that public opinion that's shifting? Do you think? I, I, I don't know. It, uh, so, so a recent study showed that there have been more mass shootings in recent years and that they've been more lethal. Uh, so that, ha I think, has an effect on public mm -hmm. opinion. And we also know that over these years, uh, the policies advocated by the NRA uh, and many Republicans have not, in fact, made us safer. And I think Americans, after a while, are just going to say, okay, I think it's time to try something new. Yeah. Well, the New York Times had that really interesting story, too, showing how many Democrats, um, you know, have gotten lower rankings from the NRA. I mean, overall in Congress. Um, it, it, I, I just wonder if the conversation with your colleagues on your side of the aisle has changed at all, maybe from more purple or even red states. Yes. Uh, so a decade ago, um, People uh, really fear the NRA, mm. including a number of Democrats. Uh, now, uh, many of us are very proud to wear this red F thing on, on our suit. It says we have an F rating from the NRA. Uh, and so you do see a shift yeah. uh, that uh, you no longer fear them anymore, which is good. Um, Awesome. Well, I want, there's a couple other policy issues I just want to touch on. I was interested. I know you have a, a bill to end cash bail in the United States. Yes. Um, we in California will be voting on whether to do that next November after the bail industry put a referendum on the ballot uh, to overturn a state law that Jerry Brown signed last year. Um, talk about that, because th because that is an area, too, where we have seen um, some sort of bipartisan agreement, not right. across the board, but... There, there are, I think, um, more libertarian-leaning Republicans, especially, who oppose cash bail Correct. as well. Uh, so uh, right now in America, there are hundreds of thousands of people sitting in uh, jails uh, in prisons, not because they've been convicted of anything, but because they can't afford to pay the fee to get out. And that uh, has a, a number of problems. One is uh, it is unfair to the poor, poor right? It's sort of like... Um, something that the poor have to deal with that nobody else has to deal with. Second, the studies show that it causes people to plead guilty at much higher rates because mm -hmm. these are the same folks uh, who can't actually stay there for weeks on end because they'll lose their low-paying job, they don't know how to deal with child care, they, they, they'll uh, lose their apartment, and so on. And then it's completely irrational because there is actually uh, nothing there that says your ability to access cash on hand has anything to do with how dangerous you are. And to sort of say money is linked to how dangerous you are is just absurd. There's really there's no link to that. And so I think we just have to give it an entire system. Uh, Washington, D.C. did that, right. and they do it based on risk analysis. So if you're dangerous, 
even if you're a multimillionaire, we're just not going to let you out. But if you're poor and you're not dangerous, we're going to let you go mm. and expect you to come back for your court hearing. And it's been amazingly successful when people come back to their court hearing about the same rate as places that have cash bail. Uh, the red state of Kentucky I was gonna did that, something yeah. similar. So it's something to have bipartisan support. So this bill, would this, this would direct states. It wouldn't just affect the federal system? So my bill uh, would basically say to these states, uh, you have a period of time, three to five years or so, to get rid of cash bail. Uh, if you don't want to start stopping um, Department of Justice grants to your state. Do you feel, oh, interesting, kind of the opposite of the sanctuary uh, fight, <laughs> but, 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 you know, in, in Congress, you would actually pass legislation as opposed, I'm talking about the sanctuary state, right? right? Um, one of the things we've been hearing here is concerns about the system, the alternate systems that are used, these um, uh, risk assessments that are right. often using algorithms and the fact that biases right. can be built into those. Right. Yep. I'm curious as somebody you know, with a computer yeah. science background, how do you approach that? What do you think should be the alternative? That's a legitimate criticism. And so uh, these alternate systems uh, have to be vetted, have to be done very carefully. And I think we should look at uh, the DC experience and see how that's got, uh, done. Um, but my view is the current system is not working. It's irrational and it already criminalizes the poor. So we might as well try a new system and then try to make it better. And so if for, for a reason the algorithm doesn't work correctly, then we can try to fix it. But at least you've gotten rid of a, a existing system that doesn't work. Um. Does it ever feel like, like you're just beating your head against a wall when you introduce these uh, bills in Congress? So my view uh, in politics is that everything seems impossible until it happens. So if 10 years ago I were to say to you, hey, in 10 years we're going to have gay marriage in 50 states and a number of them will be smoking weed, <laughs> you think I was crazy, right? That's what's happening right now. So yeah. you never know. You just sure. keep pushing. Fair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And you keep pushing on big issues. The other one I know you've been tackling or trying to um, get your arms around is online privacy uh, and data privacy. Um, I mean, can you talk about what you think the role is for the federal government and what should or shouldn't be happening? Because, you know, to be fair, I think some of these issues um, were certainly bubbling up prior to Trump. This is not just about a, a, a Republican in the White yeah, House. Yeah, so one of these issues actually... Um happened during the Obama administration, uh, where the FBI came forward and said, hey, we want back doors uh, in, in these cell phones so that, you know, quote unquote, the good guys can access the data. And so I came out strongly opposed to that. My view is we actually want to strengthen encryption and not weaken it. Encryption is what lets uh, you do banking. It's what lets the president give orders to the military without it, it having uh, being intercepted by, you know, foreign governments. It's what allows a lot of our business transactions to happen securely. And the notion that we're going to weaken this um, on the off chance that somehow the FBI would be able to get information from a cell phone to stop a potential attack uh, didn't make much sense. And we kept asking the FBI, give us one instance where it would have mattered that they could not. Uh, what they really wanted is to do this because it makes prosecutions easier. Mm. Uh, and the problem with uh, what they were advocating is some state legislators started to take this up. So in California, a legislator introduced a bill that said, okay, we're going to mandate these back doors and cell phones. And then the person in New York, a legislator did that. And that would make it impossible, right, for Apple or, or Google or other folks to make a cell phone to have to deal with 50 different encryption standards. So I introduced a bill called the Encrypt Act uh, that uh, basically it says the federal government preempts the field. States cannot get involved in, in, in encryption. Uh, the federal government is a sole authority uh, in terms of encryption. And in terms of... Uh, Did that pass? Um, it, has not, uh, it has not passed yet. And, but none of the state bills passed either, right? That is correct. Okay. So it's sort of a standoff uh, right now. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, other privacy, right, we're in a day and age uh, where it's very easy to get your identity stolen. Uh, so the one thing I'm going to tell all of you right now, um, if you remember nothing else from this, is that uh, I would almost never, ever use public Wi-Fi on your phone unless you're very sure of what that network is. So let's say you're sitting 
um, at um, SFO Airport, and you know you want to do public Wi-Fi, and two things pop up: SFO and SFO one. Would you know which one was the correct Wi-Fi? And uh, if you guess the wrong one, it could be a hacker sitting 20 feet away from you. And then once you do that, within you know a few seconds, that hacker has everything on your phone. So uh, some of you have phones set up to just log on to Wi-Fi. And so you could like w walk past a Starbucks, log on the wrong Wi-Fi, and get all your information hacked. So if I were you, I would just not do that. And you can go to um, buy these portable Wi-Fi hotspots. Mm -hmm. It's not that expensive. And I would do that if you, if you really want to have Wi-Fi. It's interesting because like in that, in that FBI fight, I mean, the tech companies in some ways were sort of the white hats, right? Like they were saying, no, 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 we want to protect your information. Uh -huh. But the debate we've been seeing here in California because, you know, the feds, federal regulators just haven't dealt with it is more around protecting like me from Facebook, not right. them protecting my information. Um, and we did pass, uh, you know, a Digital Privacy Act last year in California. It is in the yep. process of being implemented. Um, I would say the industry has tried very hard this year to try to weaken it. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the path forward? I mean, I, one of the arguments against that was that it shouldn't be a patchwork, that, you know, this should be a federal regulation. Right. Um, yet nothing's happened. I mean, yeah. do you think what happens right. here will kind of become default yeah. for the rest of the nation? Yeah. So, so I support California's law. Uh, I think, like with any big law, that you, you're not going to get everything perfect. There's, there's still some technical changes that need to be made. But in general, I support what California did. I also think it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have 50 states or 50 right. different privacy rules. In Congress, uh, there are um, different folks working on this, including the House Judiciary Committee. Um, and there's a lot it, of, like, in this case, I think that there is a lot of skepticism on both sides of these companies. This isn't just a Democratic or Republican issue. Is that fair? It is. It, it, it has bipartisan. Um, it, it could absolutely get bipartisan support. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I think it would make more sense to have a national standard uh, that um, whether or not it was exactly like California's law, uh, it has to be uh, not simply weaker than California's law. Do you think there's any chance of that happening? I, I, I hear the tech industry's gotten some pretty good lobbyists. Yeah. Well, so California is uh, the fifth largest economy in the world. So once this law uh, hits the implementation date, um, people are going to have to follow it. Mm -hmm. And so then it's just up to folks, well, do they want to do that and have other states have different things? Or do they want to have a, a federal version that hopefully, in my view, would not be uh, simply weaker than what California did. Got it. Um, I wanted to ask you about one other thing that's been in the news in California here, which is the issue of independent contractors and the gig economy. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if you've worked on that at all, but you know, there's, there, there's a court decision here in California. There's a lot of um, pushback from Uber and Lyft and these types of companies. I think uh -huh. there's going to be some protests around town today around this. Yeah. Um, where do you see it? And again, is this something that you think the federal government needs to step in around? Right. So I have not followed this particular issue closely. Generally, uh, I support uh, employees and having people classified as employees uh, as opposed to independent contractors. And unionizing. What? And, you, and, and able to unionize, is that? That is correct as well. That's something. So. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, well, we have about seven minutes left. Um, I do have a couple questions about the 2020 race, so let's be pendants for a second. Um, I like this one. What is the best way to share possibly useful ideas with Democratic candidates? What would you suggest to the public in terms of getting their ideas heard by these folks? So social media and internet uh, have sort of changed communications mm -hmm. in an interesting way. So even... Two decades ago, uh, if you want to, let's say, talk to a member of Congress, it was sort of hard. You had to, you know, call their office and get through, you know, three layers of staff, and maybe you might be able to get a schedule for a phone call for, to talk to a member of Congress. Now you can engage them on Twitter and Facebook, and, and sometimes they will respond directly to you. Uh, so I'll do that with, with folks on Twitter. Um, you heard it from the Twitter yeah. congressman. So, tweet, at, tweet at him. So I'll, I learn sometimes from, th from these conversations. And so that's one way to do it. Um, another way is to go to places where they have events. And, and uh, sometimes they have events where you can ask questions. But sometimes 
um, you can just try to talk to them at the event. And, it's a little uh, harder in California, where historically they, they come in and they don't always talk to regular people. They like to collect a lot of money. Um, but we do have an early primary this time around. We are in play in a different way. I mean, do you think that's going to give the public more opportunities to kind of see and hear these folks up close? I do. I think it's exciting that California uh, will very likely be very relevant uh, yeah. at a presidential primary. And so that's uh, going to cause these candidates to focus a lot more on California than they, than they did in the past. Uh, the other thing folks can think about doing is... Um, for example, writing letters to the editor. So it turns out that in the LA Times and the Chronicle and other newspapers do get lots of letters to the editor. It also turns out they often come from the same people. So if you all start writing in, eventually uh, you'll get published and then you can sort of get those ideas out yeah. as well. Um, understanding that you support Kamala Harris, um, maybe it'll be you talking about why she's the best person, but you know we've been hearing a lot of debate around identity politics in 2020, around the question of electability and whether voters are kind of trying to handicap what other people will do. And I'm just curious kind of what you think of that. Like, how would you counsel the Democratic electorate to think about these candidates and what is the best... Because what we see in polling is that what they're concerned about is how to beat Trump, basically. Um, but it strikes me that it's sort of dangerous to try to guess who other people might think is electable. Um, I think that's correct. I think it's hard to, to make that guess. I think it's fine to have as one of your factors who you think can beat Trump. I think that's a perfectly legitimate inquiry. Uh, the, the polls are very interesting. Uh, most of what they show is that regardless of who you put up against Donald Trump, he only gets between 38 and 40 percent of people voting for him. Uh, so at this point, you could you know, put this glass of water up against him. He'll get 38, 40 <laughs> percent voting for him. Uh, so um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, my view is it, he's Trump has had two and a half years to try to change his approval ratings. And he hasn't. He's been stuck in this very narrow range, um, somewhere between 35 and 45, and just sort of bounces up and down between that. Uh, so it's pretty clear to me he could cure cancer tomorrow or shoot someone at Fifth Avenue, and he'd still be within that same narrow range, because I think most Americans have made up their minds mm -hmm. on who he is. And uh, to me, it's more a matter of turnout next November, getting folks to actually do the one thing we need them to do, which is to vote. Yeah. How how good do you feel about that infrastructure heading into 2020? Because I think that's something that we saw in 2016 was that maybe, you know, in some of the key states, there wasn't that effort. Um, and that goes back to the, the sort of raging debate over Democrats. And, you know, yeah, do you try to get back, get back the white working class voters or try to turn out more people of color and younger voters? Um, I think you can do both. Um, you know, there were, there were things done in 2016 that I think in hindsight people would want to do differently, yeah. like having our candidate actually visit Wisconsin in the general election. <laughs> so the Democrats, right, we're having our whole convention in Wisconsin, right, ne next year. And so yeah. um, I think we've learned. And when so the, the, yeah. the candidate will definitely be there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that is correct. Awesome. All right. We have time for one more question. Um, since you are so prolific on Twitter and there so much, how do you how do you rate Twitter in terms of its effect on our democracy? Do you think it's been a good or a bad thing? I think it's generally been good uh, because y you do have the ability to communicate to elected officials in a way never before. You also have the ability to communicate to press in a way never before, right? Uh, for constituents to ask a press reporter questions or mm -hmm. make statements as a press reporter didn't happen very much. Uh, now you have this communications platform that allows lots of people to, to potentially interact. So I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's generally a good thing. All right, on balance. Congressman Ted Lieu, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, <laughs> Our thanks to Congressman Ted Liu, representative for California's 33rd District, for joining us today. I'm Marisa Lagos. On behalf of myself and the Commonwealth Club, we'd also like to thank our audience here in San Francisco and online for joining us today. Have a great one. Yeah,